Nigel Zelser, co-founder and managing partner with JBN Consulting. Good morning. I'm proud to represent JBN Consulting, once again a platinum sponsor at this year's Georgia Technology Summit. You know, as management consultants, we use innovation to our competitive advantage to help our clients deliver uh, inspired solutions to move their business forward. And it's a strategy that works. You know, talking of innovation, uh, I have the honor of introducing our next guest speaker, Kevin Ashton. Kevin is a visionary technologist who coined the term the Internet of Things. He co-founded the Auto ID Center at MIT and is the author of How to Fly a Horse, The Secret History of Creation, Invention, and Discovery. As a result, Kevin has a unique real-world perspective on what it takes to build organizations that are innovative and how to innovate, how innovative organizations and how to innovate in organizations that aren't. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Ashton. Okay, you all have to smile. There's so many of you here. You know, feel free to wave. I'm going to use special Internet of Things facial recognition software. <laughs> and if you're not paying attention, I will shame you on the Internet. Ladies? No, I'm kidding. Um, slightly. I'm going to tweet you. The hashtag is hashtag GA Tech Summit. And you now have the perfect excuse to look at your phones while I'm speaking. <laughs> so what I just did would have seemed miraculous about 15 years ago. I took this small device from my pocket, um, took a high-definition movie of everybody here in Atlanta, uh, and right now it's sort of finding its way wirelessly onto the internet where thousands of people all over the world can be looking at it. Today, it doesn't seem miraculous at all, right? We kind, of, we kind of move very quickly in technology from um, something being ridiculous. You know, one day I'm going to take a thing out of my pocket and take a movie of you all. That would be ridiculous 15 years ago. And then the next day it's miraculous. And the day after that it's kind of monotonous, right? It's like, yeah, whatever. Big deal. And so what we're going to talk about this morning is our unbelievable future, the future that we are all not only moving towards but creating. And one of the things to keep in mind while we do that is this almost instantaneous transition that we as human beings tend to make from there's no way that's ever going to happen to, oh, wow, it happened, to so what? Where's the next thing? Um, and, and to illustrate that a little bit, um, we can talk about this picture. This is not the planet Earth. Um, technically, it's not a planet at all, actually. It's, it's Pluto. This is a photograph of Pluto, one of the sort of furthest away uh, bodies from the sun that, that we know anything about at all, really. Um, and 85 years ago, you know, the existence of something about where Pluto is, about Pluto's mass, had been suspected for a while, but it was really only confirmed 85 years ago when this photograph was taken. Okay? And 85 years ago, this was miraculous. This was a, I mean, it, you know, it looks like a space invader or something, right? But it was a photograph of something incredibly far away. 
And yeah, over time, technology improved. So this is what Pluto looked like 21 years ago. Hey, it's in color now. You know? um, and then four years ago, a little better. And 10 months ago, Pluto looked like this. Eight months, oh my goodness. You know, what's happening here is, um, you know, NASA has launched a spacecraft called New Horizons, which is traveling towards the planet, which is remarkable, taking photographs of it, which is remarkable, and then sending them all the way back to Earth, which is also remarkable, um, until you end up with this. You know, an incredibly high resolution picture of the surface of this incredibly far away thing. Um, it's a nice illustration of, of kind of the arc of technology. But a better illustration actually might be the photo that comes after this one, the, one of the most recent photographs from this spacecraft. You know, what the heck? Okay. We're like back to the beginning again. Well, we're not, because this is no longer a picture of Pluto. This is a photograph of uh, a body that orbits Pluto called Kerberos. It was only discovered in 2011. Uh, one of the things you can sort of see from this photograph is it has an interesting kind of dual lobe structure, sort of a figure eight in three dimensions. Um, and the point here is that what's on the other side of the miraculous becoming monotonous is something else that seems ridiculous, right? Something else hard, another problem to solve. You know, and one day, reasonably soon, we'll probably have a nice high definition, full color photograph or movie of this object, and so on and so on. And that's how we make progress. Um, and as somebody whose sort of job is to talk about the future, you know, here's my insight, in a way, about how to think about the future. It's actually incredibly easy to predict the future. I'm going to do it this morning. Um, what is hard is believing it. Even though we have all these experiences where something that seems impossible becomes possible and then commonplace, the next time uh, you hear about something that seems impossible, somehow it's hard to believe that, that anything is ever going to change, that something that is impossible today will be possible tomorrow. And yet, making today's impossible thing possible is what we do as a species. So let me give you some easy to make hard to believe predictions. And keep in mind that if you don't believe them, I'm still right. <laughs> I'll talk about this a little bit more later. But um, you know, given the, the sort of the demographic makeup of this audience, I can be fairly confident that you will own a car that can drive itself about 15 years from now, if not sooner. We'll talk about self-driving cars a little bit more uh, later. Um, depending on how old you are, um, you know, if you're sort of as old as me, then probably your great-grandchildren will have a three-digit life expectancy. Uh, you know, for some of the younger people in the audience, it may be your, be your grandchildren. Um, one of the amazing stories of recent centuries globally, not, not just in, uh, in a sort of industrialized countries like this one, is the change in life expectancy. Um, at the end of the 19th century, so not that long ago, the late 1800s, um, global life expectancy was about 39 years old. So was, if, if I were a, a globally average person, in the late 1800s, I would have died about eight years ago. 
Today, global life expectancy, global life expectancy, is about 70 and increasing. And that creates all sorts of interesting discussions and opportunities and so on. But uh, the idea that, that a lot of people will live to be 100, particularly in, in places like the United States, uh, is, is far from ridiculous. It's actually quite a trivial prediction. Um, this freaks people out. We will discover extraterrestrial life this century. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean um, there's going to be an alien invasion um, or that you know, we're going to land on another planet and, uh, and meet you know, little green people or anything like that. Um, but the technology and, and the amazing advances in astrophysics and space exploration that lead to pictures like those ones of Pluto um, are also enabling us to understand things about very, very far away places. Um, and some of the things we are finding is that the prerequisites of organic life, things like water, are far more common in the universe than we first thought. Not that long ago, we weren't sure whether things like water were really anywhere else apart from on this planet. Now we know they're everywhere. Um, we're even finding a lot of the elements of DNA in other places. So much so that it's actually possible that uh, DNA uh, on this planet uh, arrived somehow by a, an asteroid strike or something from someplace else. Um, so given you know, how big the universe is and our ability to observe so much of it now, coupled with the fact that some of the things we think are prerequisites for organic life seem to be more common than we thought, it's highly likely that, there's, there's, that we live in a universe of abundant life. It's just further away than we've known how to reach. Um, and we'll find some. And it will probably be some cells that reproduce or some kind of you know, fungus or something, right? It, it's, not, it's not necessarily going to be you know, tool-creating, organized, um, uh, human-like life. But it's there, and we're probably close to finding it. Um, you know, following on the astrophysics theme, um, again, it's highly likely that, that the first human being to be born on another planet will, will be within the next 100 years or so, and it'll probably be Mars. Um, I, I, that will blow our minds briefly. We'll get used to it. When the second, second person is born on another planet, it, it won't make the front page of the well, there won't be newspapers, but you know, <laughs> the front page of the virtual reality brain feed or whatever it is, right? Um, is that an alien? Is that a human? Does that person want to come back to Earth, or are they quite happy where they are? You know, the, the, the frontiers in space exploration are somewhat similar to the frontiers of ocean exploration five or 600 years ago. Um, here's one that really upsets people in the South. Oh, no, no more bacon. Um, and I should stress when I say vegetarian, I mean they're not putting bacon in the green beans, OK? Um, and this is a fairly trivial prediction to make as well, because like about 30% of the world is vegetarian right now. A lot of those people live in India. Um, but for, uh, you know, sometimes for sort of reasons associated with personal beliefs, sometimes for practical reasons to do with the sustainability of agriculture, uh, more and more people are becoming more and more vegetarian and, and are assisting on, on plant-based diets or, or sometimes with milk and cheese and so on. Um, and that may not be the case in the United States quite as soon as it is elsewhere, but keep in mind, most people means 50% plus one, and we're more than half the way there. And you know, some people will be wondering, well, haven't you, haven't you heard about climate change? Don't you understand that the world is about to end any day now? Well, yeah, I've heard that. And you know, it seems like you can only have two positions on climate change in the United States. Um, you can be over here and say there's, there's no such thing. It's, it's a hoax. There's no such thing as climate change. Or you can be over here and you can say there is such a thing as climate change and we're all doomed. Pick which choice you want. Well, 
there's a third choice, right? There's, there's, there is such a thing as climate change, sorry to these people, um, but we're not all going to die. We're going to find ways to deal with it, sorry to these people. Um, and one of the reasons you can be fairly confident about that is that's what the human race does. We, we solve problems. In solving problems, we often create new ones, but we still make progress. Um, and the other thing is, um, the world has been about to end ever since it began, or at least ever since human beings were able to say the world's about to end, we've been saying that, OK? Um, there have been, uh, you know, the average over the last like 700 years, there have been about 20 widely believed, widely publicized uh, apocalyptic predictions every century. So about every five years, the world has been about to end for one reason or another, right? Um, and in recent centuries, that's just become more true. So, you know, the world was supposed to end about 80 times last century. And we're still here. Um, and if you want to make one prediction, um, you know, make this one. Say that the world is not about to end, because if you're wrong, there'll be nobody around to correct you. <laughs> um, and here's one that's kind of very dear to my heart, and this is, this is the last one, and then we'll move on. Um, but, and I'm cheating. I feel a little dishonest saying this. Within 20 years, most computers will power themselves, because people will think, oh, that's ridiculous, right? I have to plug in my phone every night, and you know, my laptop uh, only has a few hours of battery life, and uh, how, how is this even remotely true that computers will power themselves? What could that possibly mean? Um, well, the, the, the thing is, you have to think about what you mean by computers, OK? A uh, computer is really, uh, in, in modern language, an electronic device capable of performing calculations. Most of what you are actually uh, providing energy to when you charge your smartphone or your laptop or whatever it is, is not calculations. It's the screen, it's the connectivity, it's the memory storage, it's the camera. Um, you know, those are the things that, that uh, consume the energy, the stuff built around the, the calculating function. Um, and not all computer devices need screens or Wi-Fi or cellular or huge memories. Um, in fact, there's a whole class of computing devices that don't need any of those things. Um, and that's kind of the, the type of devices that really underlie this Internet of Things concept, which just means lots and lots of electronic sensors connected to the Internet, basically. And so in the, in the 20th century, the thing that drove computing was Moore's Law. Probably you've already heard of Moore's Law. It, basically, the, the, the size and or price of a certain amount of computing power halves every 18 to 24 months. That's, that's kind of what Moore's Law says. Um, one of the funny things about Moore's Law um, is that you can also say that uh, about every 18 months, there'll be major headlines predicting the end of Moore's Law. Um, and it still hasn't happened, right? I always smile when I see those. It's like, OK, here's another one. Um, but the, the law that is driving 21st century computing is not Moore's Law. Um, you know, the thing about Moore's Law is we're, we are struggling to find things to do with all this computing power now. You know, video games look like real life and so on, and you can generate computer graphics that look like real life to make movies. Um, so, you know, the utility of all this extra computing has some, has some diminishing returns. And the law that, that is really interesting in the 21st century in computer science is this one. It's, it's called Kumi's Law. Uh, Jonathan Kumi is a professor at Stanford, and he was a, the first named author on this paper that I got this chart from. Um, but Kumi's law says that the amount of energy, so really electricity, needed to perform a computation halves every 18 months and has done so since the beginning of computing. So what you see on this chart is, you know, in the, in the 40s, we had uh, like ENIAC was one of the first computers. Uh, it used, you know, a certain amount of, uh, it got a certain amount of computations per kilowatt hour of energy. And over time, you know, working through things like, you know, the Macintosh and the IBM PC and going up to, you know, laptops from a few years ago, um, you get twice as many computations per kilowatt hour 
or the same number of computations for half as, half as much electricity. And this is actually a really interesting observation because it's more consistently true than Moore's law. Um, and what that's led to is, I mean, it's, by the way, one of the, re one of the reasons, not the only reason, one of the reasons you can kind of do more with your phone on the same battery life is, is because of Kumi's law. Um, but it's also led to the rise of a new class of, of very, very low-powered computing devices that do very simple things. Um, and the, you know, the best example of those is RFID tags. Um, RFID stands for Radio Frequency Identification. Uh, basically, uh, it's like a tiny chip with a little radio antenna, um, generally capable of doing nothing more than communicating its own identification number using radio waves, hence radio frequency identification. Um, and the interesting thing about RFID tags, most of them don't have a battery on board they get their power from the radio wave that is communicating with them. And what we've seen as Kumi's law has operated on that tiny chip in the RFID tag is RFID tags have been able to do more and more with that little bit of energy they get from the radio wave. Or they've been able to communicate over longer distances. Um, and they are computers, they do do calculations because they have to manage the fact there may be more than one RFID tag in, in the field. And you know, uh, if you think about smartphones as the, the most obviously ubiquitous computer, um, you know, there's been a couple of billion smartphones sold every year for the last few years. Well, for the last few years, we've sold a billion more RFID tags a year. So the number of RFID tags, computers that power themselves, is far greater than the number of smartphones. Uh, and if you do the math on this chart, and allow me to say that all the other computers in the world are you know, fairly small in quantity relative to smartphones, you'll see that we actually already live in a world where most of the computers are self-powered. So, What's going on here? Right? How is it that we are creating all this new technology, that we're taking the miraculous through to the ubiquitous so quickly? And, and this is actually what human beings do. And it's really interesting to look at in the context of human history. Um, there have been about 2,000 generations of human being before us. Okay, that modern humans, and we'll talk about what that means in a moment, modern humans have probably been around for about 50,000 years. Throughout that time, the average age of a woman at birth has been about 25. And that's how we measure the length of a generation. Um, so it's about 2,000 generations, over 50,000 years. And what made us modern humans was our approach to tools. There were human beings, many different species of human beings, prior to us for many millions of years. And what most of them had in common, including our distant ancestors, was they used a tool. And the tool they used was this. It's called a hand axe. It's, you know, it fits in your hand. It's actually quite hard to make. You sort of flake it, flake it off until it's somewhat symmetrical. And you end up with a sort of a pointy rock. Uh, probably used mainly for sort of making food easier to chew. Uh, possibly used for occasionally for self-defense, um, or I guess you know, attacking somebody else. Um, and for millions of years, the hand axe remained exactly the same. Your grandfather's hand axe was the same as your hand axe was the same as your grandfather's grandfather's hand axe, and so on. Um, so nothing was changing with the technology that human beings were using for millions of years. It just looked like this. That was basically it. But while the technology wasn't changing, something else was. So what you see here uh, on the far left 
is the skull of an early human. And you'll see it's, it's kind of ape-like. Uh, it has a, a very large jaw, very large teeth. And this is the kind of skull that humans had when they started using hand axes millions of years ago. But the interesting thing is, if you're using a hand axe to kind of mash up your food, you don't necessarily need a big powerful jaw or big teeth. So people who are born with slightly smaller jaws, slightly smaller teeth, can still eat. They can still survive. They can still reproduce. Um, and what you see in this intermediate skull in the middle here is what can happen when the jaw gets smaller and the teeth get smaller. Um, the area in which the brain sits in the skull can become bigger. Well, that means the brain can become bigger. And over time, these smaller jawed, smaller toothed, bigger brained humans develop reproductive advantages over bigger jawed, smaller brained humans. And then the last skull is our skull. And at some point between these two skulls, one human being was born who had a very unique characteristic. They looked at their tool and said, I can make this better. I can consciously improve this thing. And that human being is the ancestor of us all. And we all carry that tendency with us. The ability to consciously look at a tool, and technology is just another word for tool, and say, I can make this better. And that was the change that led to modern human beings, and modern human beings, by the way, very quickly becoming the dominant and then only species of human being in the world. That's what makes us unique. We all possess this instinct to improve things, to create things, to make technology better. But there's another aspect to this which is interesting, right? Um, if you look at the skull that we have and you take away the tools, you actually have a species that cannot eat. Now, people say, well, you could eat a banana. Well, a banana is technology. Bananas didn't look like that 50,000 years ago. They were actually very hard fruits. They have changed to what they are today because of agriculture, which is a kind of technology. Um, human beings without technology literally cannot survive for more than a few days. Which is why it's always funny when I hear people say things like, I don't like technology. All this technology, why do we need it? Why don't we just go back to the good old days when things were simpler and there was no technology? Well, the actual answer to that question is, because you don't have the skull for it. <laughs> if you go back to the good old days before technology, you need to become a different species of human being. Okay. Um, yeah, by the way, the other interesting thing about this skull uh, on the right is if you're an engineer, you'll notice how balanced it is about the point where the spine enters. This is the skull of a bipedal creature, a creature that stands on two feet. So the, the hand axe is actually the reason we have larger brains and actually the reason we stand on two feet and, and so on. Um, you know, and we're not, just to sort of try to contrast, we're not the only creature that uses tools, not by a long way. Right? There are lots of species that use tools. We're discovering more all the time. You know, one example is birds. Birds build nests. Nests are tools. But the difference between birds and us is if you looked at the nest of this bird five million years ago, it would be exactly the same. I can absolutely guarantee you that right now there is not another meeting going on somewhere where like uh, a sparrow in a black turtleneck 
is saying, here it is. We think you're going to love it. It's Bird's Nest 6.0. Thinner, bigger, smaller battery life. All the other birds are clapping. Oh my god, I've got to get that bird's nest. Okay. No animal but us improves its tools. All these other tools, beaver's dams, bird's nests, whatever, are a result of instinct, not conscious intervention. That is what is unique about human beings. It's our propensity to create. You know, by the way, you can do the same thing about bodies with birds, right? So if you look at um, sort of pre-nesting birds, they had that kind of foot. And gradually, as nests became popular um, as a way to survive, um, some birds, sort of their, their foot changed until you ended up with birds that were uh, capable of perching. They were so good at grasping, we call them perching birds or passerines. Passerines are a fairly late arrival in the world of birds. Um, but because they can build such sophisticated nests, they can kind of live anywhere. And now more than 50% of the, the types of bird in the world are passerines. So you know, sparrow is an example. Any bird you see sitting on a telephone wire has this ability. Take the nest away from the bird, the bird dies. All tool-using species live in symbiosis with their tools. They can't survive without them. We are no different. Um, but the, the thing that's interesting about us is we have to improve our tools because our tools are so successful, they always lead to there being more of us. So what you see is, over this 50,000-year period, since this improving the tool instinct emerged, um, we went from hand axe. 10,000 years later, this is a, a sewing needle. Sort of clothes emerged. Spears, 10,000 years after that. 10,000 years after that, domesticated animals, the first of which was wolves. We call domesticated wolves dogs. Uh, 10,000 years after that, agriculture deliberate growing of plants for food. And then uh, only 5,000 years ago, the emergence of writing. Only 5,000 years ago. And then in the last 5,000 years, we've gone from the emergence of writing to angry birds. <laughs> and Farmville. Um, so the you know, question you ask is, well, why is innovation getting faster? Are we getting smarter? And the answer is no. Okay, we you know, basically have the same creative capabilities as individuals that we had 50,000 years ago. Um, you know, what's changed is population. One of the things that's hard to believe is what a small population we were until very recently. So you know, at the time that we discovered agriculture, for example, there were about 5 million people in the world. 5 million. You know, the time we discovered writing, there were about 15 million people in the world. You know, when the iPhone came out, there were about 7 billion people in the world. Uh, and so what you see is, first of all, technology enables us to support an ever larger population, um, uh, an ever more uh, kind of luxurious population, lives longer, doesn't have to worry about finding something to eat, can spend more time creating new technology. So there's more of us more able to create technology, and of course, building on all the technologies of the past. Now think about what that means for the future, right? This is a talk about the future. If you think it's like rapid innovation and acceleration today, just wait until there are 10 billion of us at the end of the century. All building on the inventions that went before, all taking advantage of the inventions that went before to make new ones. So you know, this is the story of the human race. And that trajectory will continue. Uh, you know, and, and if, if someone had to make a slide like this 100 years from now, it would be, you'd really have to like, stretch out the next 100 years, because all these amazing things are going to happen. All this incredible change is upon us. Self-driving cars, good idea. Okay? Human-driven cars are the bad idea. Right? So it's like 3,300 people killed every day. We call them accidents, but generally it's somebody texting while playing the violin while, you know not having any hands on the steering wheel. Here's the point. I want to make one point about Atlanta before I finish. Um, part of this trend towards more population is urbanization. Areas where there's very dense population, a, a very sophisticated built environment. Um, and you know, you've seen this trend uh, globally, sort of during our lifetimes. 
um, you know, more than half the people of the world live in cities today. Uh, and you know, the interesting thing about urbanization is it's a pretty good predictor of economic success. Um, and as an example, you know, this is urbanization globally, but if we contrast that with urbanization in, in the United States, you'll see that the world today is kind of where the United States was in about 1900. Uh, and the United States is becoming increasingly urbanized. And, and urban, you know, there's all sorts of problems associated with, with uh, urban living, but um, they are fantastic. Urban environments are fantastically creative environments, uh, partly because you have all these people coming together, able to collaborate, share ideas, benefit from great universities, and so on. Um, and partly because urbanization requires technology. You need things like, you know, plumbing. Uh, electrical infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, medical infrastructure, uh, and they need to scale very well. So ur urbanization is good for innovation. Now, what's been going on in Georgia during this time? And this is really interesting because Georgia's a little bit unique in this respect. Um, and I think this is, you know, this is where we'll kind of stop. Compared to the rest of the country, Georgia used to be relatively rural. But what has happened in the last 50 years or so is urbanization has accelerated here at a rate greater than the national average. What is happening in Georgia is a really interesting transition away from a rural agricultural population to an urbanized technological population. You know, and Atlanta's obviously not the only city here, but it's really at the center of this change. And you have this amazing university that I've done a lot of work with in, in Georgia Tech. Um, so the prospects for technological progress and technological development right here are incredibly exciting right now. Everything is kind of moving in your favor. Um, so, you know, it's, it's great to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, you know, keep this in mind. If you don't believe anything I've said, I'm not completely surprised. But if you do, if you can bring yourself to believe in this future, you can bring yourself to create it. You have an advantage over everybody else. I wanted to give you this appreciation. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. It was awesome. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much.